Welcome to the Awesomers.com podcast. If you love to learn, and if you're motivated to expand your mind, and heck, if you desire to break through those traditional paradigms and find your own version of success, you are in the right place. Awesomers around the world are on a journey to improve their lives and the lives of those around them. We believe in paying it forward, and we fundamentally try to live up to the great Zig Ziglar quote, where he said, you can have everything in your life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. It doesn't matter where you came from, it only matters where you're going. My name is Steve Simonson, and I hope you will join me on this awesomer journey. If you're launching a new product manufactured in China, you will need professional, high-resolution, Amazon-ready photographs. Because Simo Global has a team of professionals in China, you will oftentimes receive your listings photographs before your product even leaves the country. This streamlined process will save you the time, money, and energy needed to concentrate on marketing and other creative content strategies before your item is in stock and ready for sale. Visit simoglobal.com to learn more, because a picture should be worth 1,000 keywords. You are listening to Awesomers.com episode number 72, and all you have to do is go to Awesomers.com slash 72 to get the show notes and details and perhaps any links we discussed throughout today's episode. Now, today is a, the first part of a three-part series with Greg Silberman, and Greg is the CIO of ACG Wealth, and as you'll find out later, CIO in this case means Chief Investment Officer. He brings more than 16 years of market experience in Europe, Asia, and North America. Greg is responsible for managing the firm's global investment portfolio, as well as supervising the implementation of the company's asset management strategies. Prior to joining ACG, Greg served as the Director of Alternative Investments at Wilmington Trust, where he was responsible for managing more than, wait for it, $2 $2 billion in private equity, hedge fund, and other real estate assets, and he was also instrumental in the launch of the successful alternative mutual fund. Just think about that for a minute, being responsible to manage billions of dollars of other people's money. Uh, by the way, if that wasn't enough, he also managed another $80 billion as a member of the research team and was helpful and instrumental in that process uh, elsewhere. He was a portfolio manager analyst and product developer for Perpetual Investments in Sydney, J.P. Morgan Chase in London, and had a focus on structured derivative products. And we're going to get into hot derivative talk later on in this three-part series. Greg's also a chartered financial analyst and a chartered accountant as well. He's got a lot of experience and we're lucky to have him to come and share a little bit of his knowledge about financial uh, learning and financial uh, acumen. And uh, you're going to love today's episode. Let's jump right in now. Hello again, Awesomers. It's Steve Simonson, and I'm back again with another episode of the Awesomers.com podcast. Today, we are joined by Greg Silberman. Greg, how are you? Good morning to you, Steve. It's now good afternoon on the East Coast. I am doing wonderful. Thank you for asking. Yeah, glad to have you here. And I've already done a read-in of kind of your background and bio a little bit, but maybe you could tell us again uh, where you live today and, um, and, you know, kind of what takes up your time day to day. Certainly. So I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, been here for about 18 years now. Uh, I'm the chief investment officer at ACG Wealth, which is just a lot of lot of letters, which uh, really means that I have uh, the luxury of sitting in my office and reading and thinking big thoughts. And, uh, you know, I have investment opportunities coming across my desk at at a rate of knots that I can't even, you know, look at all of them. Uh, But I really have uh, very lucky because I have the ability to sit and learn all sorts of different things and uh, speak to all sorts of different people as far as investing money is concerned. Uh, at ACG Wealth, we run uh, uh, a number of different kinds of strategies for clients. We'll do, you know, just simple stocks and bonds listed. Uh, we'll do unlisted, which is more like a private equity or venture type investments, all the way to, uh, you know, real assets, mining and oil, uh, mining, uh, oil and gas. I beg your pardon, mining and minerals. Fascinating. Uh, that's definitely quite a uh, number of areas uh, that we'll dive into. I suspect a, a little bit more as we go through this authority episode. Uh, but I'm no linguist, but uh, I'm I'm picking up slightly different than the traditional Atlanta accent there, Greg. Uh, help me out. <laughs> yeah, well, as I say to everyone I meet, I'm from the I'm from the real deep south, 
Uh, you can't get more south than where I'm from, and that would be South Africa. I grew up in Johannesburg, and um, that's where I had my schooling, and, and then left South Africa in the, uh, what was it, the early 90s. So a lot of history, a lot of lessons um, that I learned growing up during the apartheid era in South Africa. Oh, I can only imagine. Uh, well, that definitely, uh, that it would be the true deep south then, I suppose. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, Atlanta seems south in the U.S., but in the world, uh, no question, South Africa is down there. Uh, so let me, let me ask you this, Greg. Uh, as you think about, you know, kind of investments and wealth and things like that, um, I, I know that you guys at ACG have dealt with a lot of money over there. W what kind of clients do you typically service at ACG? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question because it's not straightforward, um, Steve. So you get, look, m most of our clients are in some shape, form or another individuals. So they're either families or high net worth individuals, or maybe just, um, you know, on uh, just millennials, if you will, who are just starting the capital formation process. So we have a few institutional clients there would be endowments, foundations, and pensions, but, but really, by and large, we don't deal with those kind of clients. And the reason I uh, differentiated for you is because people grow and their lifestyle changes and they move through different life uh, events, if you will. So our larger client base, uh, our larger clients would be you know, very wealthy families. They've already generated their wealth. They were lucky enough to have a, a father or a grandfather who, who uh, was an entrepreneur, built a business, probably built a very large business, and then had a very nice exit or liquidity event. And so that genre of clients really have generated wealth. They do not need to do speculative or engage in speculative investments or, or um on, uh, businesses for that matter. What they're really interested in is maintaining their lifestyle. So that's very much an income approach. They want to generate income off the corpus, off the capital that they've accumulated, and certainly protect that capital against erosion from inflation, um, you know, any kind of sovereign concerns, confiscation of assets, which is really not an, an issue in the US, but certainly would be in other places that I've lived. Then you get other, other clients that we serve uh, who are, um, you know, approaching retirement, have built up a nice nest egg for retirement and really crossing over from that working, uh, you know, Monday through Friday to slowing down. And they really need to know, do I have enough money to do that? What kind of lifestyle can I engage in doing that? And then you've got the young, the youngers, the youngsters who are in capital formation mode. They're working hard. They're trying to save, trying to build capital, uh, but don't really have much of an income requirement because they can, uh, generate enough income for themselves uh, at the moment. Yeah, fascinating. I, I do appreciate the delineation there because uh, each of those groups have quite different objectives. And I suppose that the strategies that you guys would uh, consider or uh, conceptualize for deployment would be quite different amongst those groups. That is correct. And, and I'll add in an, an additional wrinkle to that, Steve, and something that's really kind of close to my heart or what I find very interesting about uh, my profession, just because you are, as an example, a millennial in capital capital formation mode, so you're trying to save, uh, you know, you and I both know we've met many people who are horrible savers, and we've met many people who are great savers. So there's, you know, added layers to all of that, not not just to say somebody is, you know, in is, is trying to build capital and can now save, some people from a psychological perspective don't like to save or don't like to, you know, they, they want to spend what they make. So there's all sorts of different layers and it's just not clearly uh, linear to say, okay, you're X, Y, Z age and this is your risk return uh, requirements. Yeah, fascinating. I definitely can uh, identify with this idea that, you know, some of the folks out there are all about that saving, right? And, and just every little dime goes into the, the big piggy bank in the sky, wherever that may be. And then there are others who just have to have, um, I don't know, like a voracious appetite for lifestyle. And they have to have the bigger house, the bigger car, the bigger island, whatever it is. And I well, imagine right. that you guys would find probably dealing with those two types of individuals quite different as well. Well, that's, that's entirely right, Steve. And, and it's, it's the most fascinating, and I think 
somewhat of an underexplored subject is behavioral finance or the psychology of investors in, in, in my instance, how people behave, uh, how people behave towards money is, is, is absolutely intriguing all the time. Uh, I've seen billionaires who, you know, count pennies and I've seen, you know, people with not much means uh, just literally live on a day-to-day -day basis. So there is a lot around behavioral psychology. Uh, we are shaped, believe it or not, or you would believe it, from a very early age about how uh, we have a relationship with money and how we deal with money. And a lot of that comes from things we hear, things we see, our upbringing, our parents, people close to us. They really shape our psychology around wealth. Yeah, I definitely uh, agree with that premise. And, you know, so many of us are influenced by these factors that, that may seem fairly innocuous as you go through life, right? Uh, other things, of course, you've always heard, uh, I'm sure many people in the audience and you in particular would have heard, you know, anybody who grew up during the Depression, man, they have a very rigid perspective about money. Uh, but all of the different influences as you go are probably going to have that impact. I know, uh, again, for some people, it's, it's remarkable to me how much ahead of the curve of money they like to spend. Um, I, I've known salespeople, for example, that if they weren't like up against pressure to, to make their, their you know, next sale, then they, they would just kind of be lazy and just like, yeah, I don't have hmm. any bills coming up. I, I don't have to work as hard. But other guys would you know, be just constantly uh, churning and, and kind of like the squirrels with the nuts in the tree all year round, just waiting for the rainy day. I, I think you're right that the, uh, the behavioral psychology has uh, more to be explored. So Greg, let me ask you this. Um, you, you mentioned you're from Johannesburg. Is that where you're born, by the way? Yes. What an what a, uh, amazing area. Uh, what was your first job when you were coming up, uh, either out of university or uh, what, what I like to think of as a proper job where you had somebody that you uh, reported to and, and kind of got yeah. your uh, experience? Yeah. Um, so, Steve, the way it worked in South Africa, and I think it works this way mostly in, you know, the, the, the ex-British colonies and England itself. So my first qualification was uh, as a chartered accountant, which is uh, otherwise known as a CPA here in, in the United States. And the way a chartered accountant worked there is it was essentially four years of uh, college education. And then you had to go and essentially apprentice or traineeship, if you will, in public auditing with a public auditing firm. Uh, at that time, I was with a, a firm called uh, Kessel Feinstein. Kessel Feinstein, nice Jewish firm, was um, part of the global empire of, of Grant Thornton. So my yeah. first job out of college was with Grant Thornton. It was a three-year traineeship as, a, as an audit clerk, essentially. And let me tell you, I hated every single minute of, of that job. But not, notwithstanding, it's probably the best uh, basis and education I have received, bar none, uh, looking back now. Amazing. I, I used to use Grant Thornton uh, to audit a company I used to own. It's a fascinating uh, small world. Um, now, <laughs> it, it's funny. It's, uh, as much as I like to dive into hot audit talk here on uh, the podcast, uh, but <laughs> tell me about, you know, what, what about that experience? Obviously, you found it to be largely additive to your skill set, but you didn't like it. What, what part of it didn't you like? I'm curious. Well, there was no room for, for creativity in auditing. And these were the days, and gosh, I I'm, I'm, might be dating. Yes, we used computers at the time, but a lot of our audit files were manual paper files, right? So you could only use a pencil um, when you did auditing, so you could rub out, uh, you, you know, any mistakes. And then we had this uh, reference system that I can't even remember it, but there was a green pen and a red pen. And the red pen was like you were referencing to and the green pen you were referencing from. And it was just, it was, um, yeah, I felt like I was checking somebody's homework. Oh. And, uh, you know, and 99% and, and of the time the homework was fine and I wasn't, you know, wasn't going to find anything, any any smoking gun, not, not, the, not where I was looking. So, uh, you know, it was very in very detail orientated in the numbers all the time and not much room for, uh, you know, uh, creativity. Obviously, there are changes as you move on and you grow a little bit into it. But, you know, auditing is, um, um, I, I don't know, it, it just didn't have that level of creativity that I was looking for, essentially. 
Well, I can certainly understand. There's not a lot of audit firms running around uh, talking about, hey, we're the most creative audit firm out there. Uh, you almost, uh, you really do want homework checkers, I think, in so many ways. So that obviously didn't resonate with you. Um, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I'd love to talk about just a couple of the defining moments and, and things that you've experienced along the way. Because, you know, as you've become, you know, an expert in investment, that so many of the entrepreneurs in the audience out there listening, we don't fully appreciate or understand that world. I'm, I'm curious about how you got onto that road from the auditing, and we're going to do it uh, right after this break. Be right back. Hey everybody, Steve Simonson here, and I wanted to introduce you to one of my heroes in this awesomer review moment. Hollowinder left us this review. Awesomers is awesome. Wow, in the first episode, Steve promised to bring at least 180 more. But just this first show could have counted for more than a dozen. It's a long first episode, but worth every minute. Just made it to the top of my playlist. Can't wait for more. And I just want to say a big shout out and thank you to Hollowinder for leaving that uh, excellent review. It made my day for sure. And we look forward to seeing your review very soon. Okay, we're back, everybody. It's Steve Simonson joined today by Greg Silberman. And uh, he's talking a little bit about uh, his past right uh, before the break there. But I wanted to ask Greg, um, what defining moment have you had kind of maybe between that that auditing experience you had and today that kind of set you on the road to, to where you've become such an investment professional? Well, let, let me let me back up a sec, if I may, Stephen, and, and sure. reframe your question. So um, I'd like to bear with me for a minute as I tell a quick story. So I, um, you know, I grew up in South Africa. I guess I was a child of the 80s. And, um, you know, we had just come out of a very large gold bull market in the 60s and 70s and the early 80s. So South Africa was quite strong economically coming into the 80s. Uh, and that was by and large by virtue of, of the, the, the amount of gold that South Africa was endowed with. Uh, I remember as a kid, my mother took me to the uh, Johannesburg Stock Exchange one day. And I must have been about, let's say, 12, 13 years old. And they had this, uh, this little, um, uh, tour where you tour around and they show you you know different man and then mines and whatever and then they show you this presentation uh, and the presentation is probably the most um, uh, you know indoctrinated presentation you'll ever come across there's the, the old South African flag flying in the wind there and there's the uh, spring buck which is the national buck uh, jumping up and down and they pour in gold and you know just from sea to sea what a wealthy country this was and oh it was great it was interesting and then, Steve, uh, the, the show finishes and was the old projector, so the projector shuts down. And the window, the curtain, and it's a very large, you know, from one side to the other curtain, starts rolling back. And as it's rolling back, there beneath you, I saw the, what was then the open outcry system on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange floor. And, you know, it didn't take very long to see some whoops and cheers and uh, papers flying up into the air. And you see the guys marking uh, prices on the chalkboard. And I was, I was just blown away. It was like I had just arrived somewhere and I didn't know where I was and uh, just drawn in totally to that atmosphere. Uh, and I, for, for whatever reason it was, I decided I wanted to be a part of that, that you know, excitement or whatever it was, and there were numbers, and I enjoyed numbers, and so that's what kind of got me on the road, so to speak, and so from a very early age, I knew what I wanted to do. I didn't really know how to to get it done, uh, and, it, and I had some good coaches and mentors along the way that did coach me a, a, along the way, uh, and so I went the CA route, the Chartered Accountant route, and, and did that, and as I said to you before, wasn't wasn't my finest hour, but certainly learned the, the language of business, which is balance sheets and income statements. Uh, and then after that, uh, now we're going into the um, you know the mid 90s. A lot of my colleagues were leaving South Africa in droves. Uh, we had just emerged from apartheid. We had just had uh, open and uh, free, and I'm saying that in quotation marks, elections. I assume they were free to a degree. Nelson Mandela was released from jail. And uh, he had just become the new first black president of South Africa. It was actually a wonderful time and great to be there in person and, and to behold that. The problem that South Africa was experiencing, and I, and I am digressing a little bit, 
was that so much weaponry had been pumped into the country uh, by the Russians and, and by others to try and you know, liberate the country. Now you had a situation where there was no political issue, but you had a lot of guns on the ground uh, in the arms of people who didn't have a lot of wealth. And so that was a recipe for disaster. Uh, I saw it, a lot of my friends saw it, and we were looking for greener pastures. Those greener pastures took me to, to London uh, because London was an easy hopping off point from South Africa. We, there were still some reciprocal work visa programs that we could take, avail ourselves to. Uh, and when I got to London, uh, you know, things were booming. Things were really going great. And I was lucky enough to uh, find a, a position at JP Morgan Chase working in their swaps derivative unit. Uh, and I, I was essentially the, the computer junkie. I was the computer nerd. And the guys would come to me and they would say, Greg, here, we're just doing this equity swap or this equity derivative. These are the counterparties. We need you to, to code it up into the system, which was essentially Excel and, and Linux based. Uh, and I did that. And again, it's, you know, when you see things from the, the bottom up, you get to learn the business. Uh, and all of a sudden, that to me became the first sign of the investment business that I became aware of. And I realized the, the uh, extent of it and how big it was and, and what was actually happening. And, and again, that just drew me in further and further into the business. Let's pause here for a moment and take a quick sponsor break. Hey, Amazon Marketplace professionals, this is Parsimony ERP, and we get one question over and over. Can you please tell me exactly what Parsimony does? Well, we'll try, but this is only a 30-second spot, so we're going to have to hurry. Connect to your Seller Central account and pull all the new orders. Enter the orders with all customer data. Enter all of the Amazon fees and charges. Store them at the item level. Generate profit and loss reports at the SKU level. Automatically generate income statements. Handle multiple companies. Handle multiple brands. Handle multiple currencies. Facilitate budgets and forecasts. Store all customer interactions in a sophisticated CRM system. Manage your supply chain. Budget and task management. Maintain an audit log. Hey, you get it. That's parsimony. P-A-R-S-I-M-O-N-Y dot com. Parsimony dot com. We've got that. Boy, I always enjoy getting a real deep look at somebody like Greg and, and their experience. Uh, I hope you, you know, enjoyed this, this first part of the three-part series. We're breaking it into three pieces partly because we want to make sure that you guys can consume the amount of content we're producing at awesomers.com in a almost like a day-to-day -day basis. In the past, we've been producing as much as an hour or more of daily content, and we just know that the factory's producing more than the consumers can consume. And so we're trying to balance that and uh, make sure that we match the time that you have with the time that it requires for getting through one podcast. Now, by the way, on a selfish note, my time has been completely smashed in July, August, and September keeping up with a uh, daily podcast. So uh, I hope that this serves the audience well, but I can tell you it will also help my life and uh, not drive me insane. Turns out working for free and driving yourself insane, not the best combination. So awesomers out there, if you're listening, uh, again, this has been episode 72. Go to awesomers.com slash 72. Uh, you can see the show notes and details there. And don't hesitate to get out there and leave us a review. Awesomers, this is a great time to run over to iTunes or Google Play or Stitcher, uh, Spotify, wherever your favorite podcast platform is, and leave us a review. Those five-star reviews are like fuel in the tank for myself and the team, and we'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for that generous effort. Well, we've done it again, everybody. We have another episode of the Awesomers Podcast ready for the world. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you've enjoyed our program today. Now's a good time to take a moment to subscribe, like, and share this podcast. Heck, you could even leave a, a review if you wanted. Awesomers around you will appreciate your help. It's only with your participation and sharing that we'll be able to achieve our goals. Our success is literally in your hands. Thank you again for joining us. We are at your service. Find out more about me, Steve Simonson, our guest, team, and all the other Awesomers involved at awesomers.com. Thank you again. Dot com.